Welcome to Jay's Analysis. I had a request from a YouTuber named Deflating Atheism, and I got a chance to watch some of his videos today. And he reached out and said, let's have a discussion. Let's talk atheism and let's talk naturalism. And we're, we've already got the atheist bots thumbing it down. So here they come. Anytime you do a, a discussion on this topic, here they come and they're ready to thumb your stuff down. They don't even know what we're going to talk about. How are they going to thumb it down? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Fine. They already know they hate it. Right. So I got to see some of your your dissections of uh, like TJ Kirk and and, and people like that, uh, other so-called logical atheists. And you reached out and said you want to do a, a discussion deflating atheism and poking holes in atheist uh, assumptions. So how do you want to get going on that topic? What? Uh, yeah. Well, actually. The tagline to my channel is, is poking holes in, in atheist propaganda, and, and I, I was looking at your videos, and that seems to be the general, not atheist propaganda in your case, but but the uh, propaganda in general. Would that be fair to say? I mean, I mean, that's kind of the the uh, overall topic of, of what you of what you tackle. You know, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, the book I wrote is on propaganda and movies. Uh, my my graduate work master thesis was on propaganda and pop fiction and then a lot of the apologetic stuff is analyzing assumptions of propaganda so yeah you're on the you're on yeah. the right track there yeah so that's it uh, uh, I've had my channel for like two years I've done a, a pretty good job of like keeping on the topic of, of just taking these artifacts of, of atheist propaganda whether they come from YouTube, or the mass uh, media, or even entertainment. I don't really do that so much, but uh, and, and just just uh, uh, tackling it and taking it seriously and addressing it, and uh, like actually addressing the substance of atheist arguments. There, there's not a whole lot to it. It should it's deserving of like a like an afternoon of your time at most. Yeah. So I also examine atheism as a phenomenon. And I make uh, some some conjecture about the the psychology and the kind of the sociology behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What uh, what what do you think are some of the patterns that you see? I mean, when when I approach it apologetically, I have a very specific way of going about it. I, I critique the worldview as a whole. I look at you know that I look at the knowledge, the epistemology. I look at the metaphysical assumptions, and I look at the ethical assumptions of their paradigm. And across the board, that seems to be, in my view, the most uh, most effective way to really critique every single atheist view, because you find that they all have the same starting ground. They all have the same presuppositions. They're all going to start on the assumptions of naturalism, the assumptions of subjectivism, the assumptions of uh, naive empiricism, on and on and on and on. Uh, and you'll Which find these internally contradictory, but yeah, exactly. That's what I want to do is is always point out the internal contradictions because they they act like they have the the claim on logic. They act like facts and logic are in their side. But when you actually start talking about what logic is or the the ontological metaphysical status of what logic is, silence. Yeah. They're in, they're in another dimension. What are you talking about? Same gesture. Yes. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, uh, unfortunately, they they often don't even seem to know what the word uh, logic refers to. It has it has a very specific meaning. It has a very specific technical meaning. It's not just some feel good, let me feel smart about myself word that you throw out just to uh, bamboozle your your opponent. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, you can go deep. I mean, I mean, uh, I think a lot of times when Christian apologists kind of uh, try to address the epistemological basis of, of their opponent's argument, they reach deep for an answer when there's a, a, a much more immediate answer close at hand. Yes, you know, I agree. They'll say, you know, if an atheist says, you know, everything we know can be proven by science, it's not necessary to reach over here and say, well, how can you know anything? It's just say so just point out the obvious fact that what they just said is, is self invalidating yes exactly oh, that I'm that phrase yeah that phrase itself is not something that can be empirically scientifically validated and uh, you know what you point that out a lot and most of the time it, it, it gets ignored and the response is you're playing word games yeah uh, and this is very ironic because this is what they will often accuse the theists of doing of, of playing word games 
and then they'll turn around and try to go back to using logic as the as the the debate or the discussion progresses and you just have to keep calling them back to the fact that but look you're using something that in your perspective doesn't make any sense at all it doesn't make any sense how on a, on a metaphysical naturalism assumption there could be something like an invariant law a rule a maxim a principle operant in the world and somehow operant in our minds and in our daily living and how we build bridges based on these you know logical mathematical principles uh, and they're not material that doesn't make sense in a world of flux matter that's always constantly in movement and changing uh, and 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 when, once you start going down that route i've never ever seen an atheist have any even even slightly sensible response to yeah. these kinds of questions yeah well that, that kind of goes into what i wanted to talk about is 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 atheist propaganda uh it is as i said in my messages to you it, it's very boilerplate it's it's you'll you'll encounter the same phrases over and over and over but it's not just uh the expressions they use themselves there there are other tactics that are are kind of alarmingly uh uh, uh just standardize uh for one and one of the things uh we kind of uh, uh apposite to what you just said are these kind of escape hatches they have the, these kind of escape hatches that they pull to to eject themselves from uh, maybe an uncomfortable spot in, in the discussion mm -hmm. and uh if you've ever noticed i mean we've all heard i'm sure you've heard dozens and dozens of times it's like you know invisible sky fairy and bronze age goat herders and all that stuff but there are also like tactics i guess you would be more uh, uh, knowledgeable about this, but they're almost like Alinsky tactics, where you you state your position to them, and they phrase it back to you in an altered form. They lie about what you just said, and it's always the same. They always misrepresent your position in the same that's, way. That's a good point. Yeah, and and that's I think a sign of the inner conflict that's going on in the, in the atheist mind. Yeah, because really what's going on in atheism is is a contradiction and a, a, a fundamental at root clash within themselves over on the one hand wanting to have a world that's that's ordered that's logical that's rational that manifests these scientific laws and principles in nature these natural laws and at the same time in order to to go against anything that's quote immaterial or that can't quote be seen or whatever they have to constantly also set up a position of total irrationality. So, for example, a lot of times in, in those kinds of debates, I'll talk about your your ultimate metaphysical assumption of the absolute, or or you know, a lot of times they'll talk about uh, pantheism. They'll say Richard Dawkins, so I, I, I'm a pantheist. I, I, I can support pantheism, but I can't support anything like a deity. I can support aliens, but I can't support pantheism. Uh, so they'll have this this assumption that that there's a, some kind of absolute universal principle that does in some way apply. Sometimes it's quote logic. Sometimes it's math. Sometimes it's scientific laws. Sometimes it's whatever. And so again, those are contrary to the principles of everything being pure chaos, pure evolutionary flux, pure change. And, and so they don't even realize that they're caught in a dialectic of, on the one hand, the very thing that that they need in order to make their yes. arguments logical is the very ground the gr very ground that they're standing on is theism because in my view god is the only thing that makes sense of things like logic ethics mathematics and when you bundle all of those things together all of them that is, it makes perfect sense in a theistic worldview it does not make any sense in a in a worldview of, of pure chaos and nothingness and just not, not even talking about physical laws which which are a whole other thing but mm -hmm. yeah uh, uh the fudge uh they would typically do there is, is to claim that that the laws of logic are descriptive rather than prescriptive which doesn't really solve their problem at all because the whole point about being descriptive is that it describes something outside of itself so that doesn't really solve their problem at all Exactly. That's a good point. And, and if you notice in the, in the debate, if you happen to see the debate I did with JF um, and other atheists that I've interacted with, they will oftentimes deny free will. Now, not all of them do, but That's, I was going to go there. I was going to go there. Yeah. Many of them do. And what this amounts to is what's sometimes called the naturalist fallacy or the determinist fallacy. And it's always important to hammer this home because 
what we see in this is an illustration of a, a again a fundamental contradiction to where they want credit for discovering the truths that they've come to they want credit for their will and their their might engaged in the combat of reason and debate and, and, and the courageousness of throwing the courage. off the shackles of of casting off the shackles of religious superstition to, yeah. to gain I always, the world. I always think of Jesse the I always think of, of, yeah. of religion yeah I always think of Jesse Ventura going I don't need a god to be my crutch right <laughs> now at the same time these people will they'll turn around and say 99% of the time they'll say there's no free will we're not you know yeah, so our, yeah. Our, yeah so so you didn't come to your positions you didn't yeah. discover these you don't deserve any courage or credit or moral uh, appropriate uh, appropriate right, or uh, moral uh, uh, acclaim because yeah. you were courageous you're just like a weed growing, dude. You're just like a I science know. project of baking soda and vinegar bubbling over. That's all you are. There's no. There's like no does, does the baking soda bubble over courageously? Does yeah, right. it passionately? No, it just bubbles exactly. over. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean that that's obvious to me. Is that is that materialist determinism cannibalizes. Uh, all the virtues that atheists would love to apply to themselves. So I, I think. Uh, a lot of their anger, and I would I would uh, apply this in different situations too. I, I, it, I, a lot of their anger uh, uh, at Christians, at theists in general, uh, stems from a kind of projection of their own frustrations with their own worldview. It's kind of like this is a, a potentially volatile example, but like when 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 pro choicers accost a pro lifer, and you know, oh, you just want to control women's bodies. Well, they're they're projecting their frustration at their own view that 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 they are basically uh, uh, prisoners of their own biology. It's a it's a very dreadful view. So I think they kind of externalize that unhappiness onto their ideological opponent. I think that's the, kind of what, what's going on with with atheists and and Christians is that they have this frustration. They want to be the courageous actor. They want to be brave and and, and rational and and. and they want to feel superior to to their uh, uh, you know benighted uh, whatever. <laughs> I was about to bust my my uh, fedora out, but I don't. It's in my. <laughs> oh, you're gonna I have a character. <laughs> yeah, I have a fedora, but uh, I'll wear it as a joke if I'm gonna be the atheist guy. But um, yeah, that, that's a great insight. In fact, to the the psychology of the the committed atheist is the internal struggle and the contradiction that I think you're right manifests itself in that anger at everybody else. And actually I've seen this in a lot of people. It's not just something that you see uh, in, in the atheists. Like you said, it, you see this in the, the radical anti-life crowd. You see this in the people who, who act out and do these kinds of bizarre, you know, like Street feminist, dem feminine, feminist demonstrations. Yeah. They do the same kind of weird stuff and, and they are really projecting their own inner just hatred. Uh, outside. And I think that this is, again, that's a manifestation of the inner dialectical conflict between loving yourself to the point of idolatry and, and thinking you're, you are your own God. And at the same time, hating yourself and despising yourself. So there's these two, these two things at war uh, in the mind of, uh, of the unbeliever. Yeah. Yeah. And then, well, I mean, no one can consistently uh, believe themselves to not have free will. I mean, the, yeah. no one can really pull off that that high wire act. I mean, that's a great point because a lot of times they'll want to, if if they do go into a, a, an argument about this, they'll try to keep it in the realm of theory, and they yeah. won't ever bring it back into the realm of the here and now. Because when you bring it back into the here and the realm, realm of here and now, you point out that you don't actually live according to your atheist materialist presuppositions. Like, why do you go to a funeral? Right. I mean, yeah. there's absolutely no reason to go to. Right. Why do you talk about loving your girlfriend? That's not really true, right? Oh, it's just yeah. a chemical reaction. Uh, you know, whatever, but, but yeah, so in their daily life, they're mad if somebody doesn't give them their change back. They, they expect the proper change. No, there's no reason to give you proper change, bro. Like, you don't, there's no, there's no logical force binding me to do that. Uh, oh, the non-aggression principle. Uh, why should I follow the non-aggression principle in a world that's pure jungle? I, I found that about uh, a lot of a lot of libertarians. They think like the nap is just this magic wand they can wave over everything that that's going to solve every, every sort of uh, potential social conflict. You know. Yeah, that's a very naive and ahistorical view. The volunteerism is just gonna is just gonna make everything work together. 
We're, right, and and, and uh, many many of them are atheists. So why why is there such a thing as, as voluntarism? Why is there such a thing as free will? I mean, that presupposes the idea of a of a, a subject, a, a psyche, a mind with volition, with responsibility, with creativity, with will. Yeah, and what what possible gain uh, is there to uh, factoring it out entirely? What does it matter, even if it's true? What is the <laughs> virtue in believing what is true? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a, you can always kind of stack these questions on even further and say, but again, in, in this materialist, uh, uh, you know, flux universe, none of that even matters. You're just basically a, a, a drop in an infinity of nothingness, right? So your life is a little blip on the radar screen in the span of eternity, a past and eternity, you know, future means nothing. Well, so that, that's why I think the, the best strategy is always to uh, illustrate how what they say uh, is internally contradictory yes. before, by holding their beliefs to their own standards uh, uh, before examining those standards themselves. That's why I always say go for the immediate response before you get into those kind of deep epistemological questions. So I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, most of the time, the easiest way to do this is to is to focus on the moral or the ethical questions, because in that worldview, there's no basis at all for for uh, objective moral or ethical standards. Now, they'll talk a lot about it that, well, the most common answer I hear is that eventually we'll figure out a scientific way to have <laughs> moral standards. Now, science, which is a good thing, right? Science is a tool for understanding the natural world, for doing engineering and all kinds of things. Nothing wrong with that. It makes perfect sense in a world regulated by providence and providence and, and uh, God's divine principles operant in the world. But science doesn't make sense in terms of its regularity on a, on a worldview, which is, again, chaotic, uh, random, uh, just one damn thing after another, as many atheists have said. So, so the very thing that we are turning to as a kind of new religious approach and, and i totally believe scientism is you know the, the religion of our day um it becomes obviously a new dogma and you will hear them talk about it in the exact same way that a person who has a religious commitment views their perspective and i believe this is because humans are fundamentally religious beings so you'll hear them say well one day we'll figure it out right so they have this they have the eschatological hope that one day uh there'll be a moral calculus according to jeremy bentham and the other yeah. Uh, utilitarians will come up with a moral calculus with a giant supercomputer that will figure out how one thing is right and one thing is wrong, right? Total gobbledygook, right? Which That's called a, a hedonic <laughs> calculus, essentially. Just mm -hmm. measuring things by the avoidance of pain, which is a horrible worldview, yeah. But, the, the yeah, but I, it's amazing how many people will, will think that that's like a solid answer to the question of how, uh, in the atheistic materialistic perspective, we can have you know, standards and, and objective notions of right and wrong. It's, well, we'll do the, we'll do the moral calculus. We'll have utilitarianism. Don't you know that's been tried? Don't you know that that, that leads to uh, obviously absurd conclusions? I mean, for example, you have no way to know in a utilitarian perspective whether you should choose the pleasure, the pleasure principle of one in a in a qualitative sense, like one guy who gets a whole lot of pleasure out of one thing, yeah, as yeah. opposed to like a million people that get a little bit of pleasure out of something. Yeah, you don't have any. There's no way to know. Like, oh, you're supposed to do this one, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and I'll I'll give you the floor after this. But but one one thing I always point out is that that let's say there's one guy who 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 we can we can come up with a moral calculus that says that 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 this guy, even though he's innocent, let's say the whole village, the whole town is worried about a, a serial killer on the loose. Okay. Now we could let him go, um, but people are going to be afraid and upset and terrified. It might cause a lot of social disturbance, right? Businesses won't get their, you know, they won't sell their, um, their wares. They won't be able to, you know, do business because people are terrified of the serial killer at night, right? So, so you uh, nab an innocent guy to create the we illusion. nab an innocent guy and we put him to death publicly in the in the public square, and it quells everybody's fear, even though he wasn't the right guy. Now, so in the moral calculus, how do we know whether the quantitative assurance and and, and rest and ease of the population uh, is or isn't better than the execution of the innocent guy? 
<laughs> yeah, well, they, they're all uh, in this calculus. There are all sorts of problems with uh, finding the uh, proverbial area under the curve. I mean, I mean, uh, Christopher missing the mark is a guy I do uh, uh, hangouts with. He was like, "Okay, well, is it better for a, a, a million creatures to flourish for two months, or for for yep. uh, five creatures to flourish for for two million years?" I mean, that's, that, a, that's you, a great variation. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it's it's never mind that that uh, uh, the equation of, of creaturely flourishing with morality is is simply by dint of assertion, you know. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, you probably don't keep up with this. Did you see uh, uh, when Sam Harris posted his his I think his his freshman uh, uh, intro to philosophy one hundred and one attempt at getting getting an ought from an is. And he posted it on his Facebook page. He was getting savaged wow. by his own followers in the comments to his own uh, Facebook page. <laughs> so he, he he's getting pushback, and you'll see this a lot. I think with a lot of the uh, uh, you know atheist uh, 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 superstars is that they're getting more and more pushback as time goes on. I think uh, uh, what was it? Were you involved with that? No, it was it was some guy. Uh, 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 What's what's the name? Buddha, mouthy Buddha. Yeah, he posted a picture where where he said it used to be the case where if he posted uh, something anti-religious, it was just great and people loved it. Now he says now I'm starting to get more and more pushback. Mm -hmm. he was just talking about in recent months. So this is a very recent development. And his idea, and I don't really uh, want to speculate on that, is that is that Jordan Peterson is poaching a lot of Sam Harris's followers. I did see some of this. Yeah, I didn't see the thing about his uh, his his followers savaging his uh, his oh, argument. No, this, was, this was something else. This was okay, something. but but I did see the the claim about uh, you know Jordan Peterson kind of grabbing some of the Sam Harris crowd, and and ultimately I think that's a good thing. I mean, I, I have uh, you know some. I, yeah, I'm, he, Jordan Peterson is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, yeah, I, I think I have some, but actually, believe it or not, uh, I've seen him tweet out uh, transcendental arguments. In fact, he tweeted he tweeted a thing several years ago that was quite literally an argument I made in a paper about Platonism and the status of numbers. Uh, not not 100 positive if you read it or not, but we do have mutual contacts that he does a lot of shows with. So. Uh, again, I'm not saying for sure that he read the paper, but um, I think it's entirely plausible that he read it. And and he does seem to kind of at times hint at using a transcendental argument, which is what I tend to to use in my apologetic approach. I think it's the most solid uh, apologetic methodology out there. Um, and to be a little more specific on that point, I do think you can use the cosmological or the teleo teleological or the ontological, but I think they have to be kind of formatted in a um, in a transcendental way to make them a little more powerful than they are traditionally, especially in something like Thomism. So I have a pretty severe criticism of, of Aquinas and Thomism, uh, but that's not to say that you can't still do a transcendental form uh, of, of each one of those of those arguments. But anyway, that's a side issue. I think yeah, I think. Um, the the skeptic community has been on the decline. I think you're right. This is something that's been especially evident in the last few months. And I, I think this is going to continue. I've been saying for a long time that, that these, these internet atheists would not be able to get away, and the pop atheists, the big guys, would not be able yeah. to keep getting away with bad arguments in the age of the internet. It's not going to work because people are going to keep chipping away at this. And eventually people are going to start seeing that's a bad argument, dude. Like, yeah, like, yeah. like literally Dawkins and these guys, and I've got Dawkins books here. They, they, they just rehash like 1700s era philoso French revolution atheist arguments. It's like, they don't even think about the fact that, Hey, maybe I should actually educate myself on more re like maybe theists have responded in the last 300 years to these bad arguments from 1700. Well, I mean, that's, that's their entire presupposition that they are the rational elite. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, no, they, they, they remember, I mean, remember like back when, when Sarah Palin was a big thing and everyone always used the same word. They called her incurious and they always say, oh, well, Sarah Palin's so incurious. That is like the exact word to define, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins and his acolytes. It's like one of them will jump out at you. Well, if, if God made the world, then, if, then who made God? It's like, do you not think that maybe somebody might have had an answer to this? I'm not even, it's not even a big concern of mine that you don't know what people have 
said, because that's that's a problem that could be remedied. But when you you care so little even to find out. And uh, the other thing, and this is going back to like atheist propaganda, you will notice uh, the atheist will always demand of you, where is your evidence for God? And they, I like, they said your, uh, like it's to trivialize or belittle it. So you're supposed to give your little show and tell presentation. You know, here's my evidence for God. I'm humbly submitting it. Uh, they never say, hey, what are what are some good resources I could use to educate myself? You know, would you mind <laughs> pointing me in a direction? No, you're, it is incumbent upon you to present your evidence uh, on a little silver platter so they could swat it away like like a gay French king or something, you know? <laughs> like, no, oh, this evidence displeases me. This is not evidence. Bring bring me my little John goblet full of uh, yes. wine. Yes. Yeah. Bring it to them a little good bring, drink. Bring, bring, yeah. bring my wine, Lynch. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I don't find, generally speaking, a lot of actual philosophical knowledge on the part of the atheist. No. Even the ones that I've encountered in my academic career, which you know most of the professors I had would be atheists. There was a few theists, but most of them were pretty hardcore committed. Uh, atheists and naturalists and materialists and I would always you know oftentimes have you know pretty lengthy interactions with all the professors I even had public debate with uh, my philosophy of science professor who was a hardcore naturalist uh, my uh, sophomore year so a public debate so what I tended to start noticing is that even amongst these academic elite uh, you know of of the atheist world they they don't even know oftentimes kind of basic philosophy yes um in other words they they've never had a class in logic they don't know about informal fallacies they they couldn't tell you what no true scotsman fallacy is they couldn't tell you what the bandwagon fallacy is but they will pontificate about all kinds of things especially if they're a hardcore darwinist that usually so maybe they've had like biology right maybe this guy yeah. studied a lot of biology and maybe he knows a lot about life science to a degree in a, in a very limited scope. But when you start talking about logic or, or principles of logic oper operant in the world or in nature, or the, again, meta logic, which I talk about a lot, what, what you get is like glaze and then, like, <laughs> and then how you're a bad person, right? So yeah. you're an arrogant uh, whatever for talking about something that, that I don't know about, right? Um, and that's because, well, for a lot of reasons, but uh, U.S. education and then education in the West for a long time based on the Prussian model is very compartmentalized. And you can literally get your Ph.D. in something and never have had a logic class. Well, that's what I was going to say is that even within even within philosophy, there are a lot of strands. Now, if, if a guy is, is uh, you know, did did his entire uh, coursework all through like Derrida and Foucault, there's no reason for him to know metaphysics or logic. I mean, I mean. That, that's a completely different track. And so I think, I, I think yes, there, there are a, a strong atheists in, in academia who would be able to furnish reasons for a, their atheism, whether those reasons are any good or not. And yes, uh, there are some very lettered academics in philosophy who present very puerile and poor arguments against the existence of God. But uh, a lot of them just are, I think, are more apatheists. You know, they, they're just not interested in it at all. You know, they, they would take the atheism of someone like like uh, Marx or, or, or Nietzsche, where it's just kind of square one, you know. Yeah, I mean, are you saying that, that you don't think, you think some of them do make a, a coherent case? For, you think some of them should not have had to have? logic i mean I, I feel like you should no, have i mean i'm not saying that at all I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed in principle to the idea that there is a, a wonderful argument for atheism sitting on top of a very high shelf i just know that that that's a, a shelf that would be too high for uh for uh, most internet commentators to reach and uh oh, I'm not opposed to, to the possibility that it's out there i haven't personally encountered it you know Right, I think though. Well, what I do notice, what I do notice is that is that when I do get a slightly more literate uh, atheist uh, in my comments, and they they reference uh, uh, atheistic philosophers who they think have uh, uh, powerhouse arguments, they always reach back to like the nineteen seventies at the very latest. Mm. So, so that's just a, a, a anecdote, but yeah. 
Well, that's interesting because there were uh, actually it was in the 70s. There were papers in Europe, especially in mathematics. They were starting to question the mathematical principles behind uh, purely natural selection. They were starting to point out that this even mathematically doesn't really work. Yeah. Um, and a lot of but a lot of, again, professors don't don't even know that. Um, you can track down those papers, but I'll try to link them below. Uh, I'll put okay. the links in later. But uh, but yeah, this has been something. What I'm getting at is that the compartmentalization of education has led to the idea that you can know everything about some small area, and that makes you like the king of reason and makes you super rational. But you don't know how to connect your your niche to other areas of thinking and really that was the whole idea of the university as it comes out of the the middle late middle early and late middle ages was a universe right it was yes. the idea that that all the sciences and all of the the legitimate areas of research the trivium and the quadrivium and and how to approach the world they're all under god they're all one uh way of of approaching uh, different areas of life and and they all cohere and they make sense because of being under God. And then what we have after secularization of the French Revolution and the, the Enlightenment, all these things is the breakdown, not just of the social order, but also of pedagogy to yeah. where it becomes extremely hyper focused. Again, I'm not saying you can't be focused on some some uh, niche or, so, or some, you know, specific area that you want to be focused on. Nothing, nothing wrong with it. The point, though, is that the 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 person who would study biology would have had in a classical education logic. So they would have been yes. able to understand that when Aristotle, for example, looked at the natural world and when he wrote about logic, he saw it as something operant in the, operant in the world, as did Plato, as did any of the classical uh, uh, greats of Western civilization. The church fathers looked at the world and they saw logic and these, these classical educational principles as things operant in nature and in the world, right? Music, geometry, all of these things tied together because they were all related to things like mathematics, which ref which reflect the divine mind. Yes. God ever arithmetizes. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, I, I think, I think another kind of a uh, uh, thing that happened at the same time is, is the kind of attitude of hostility that emerged between, between academics and, and the whole lay culture. I, yeah. I think that cohesion uh, evaporated around the same time, you know, and so now I think there's a there's a lot of elitism and there's a lot of hostility, where whereas I I think there is a, a, a view to be taken where where all knowledge is is kind of part of the same organism and and the intelligentsia and and, and everyone else, including you know, the people doing essential work and 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 the uh, you know religious uh, uh, clergy, they're all part of the same organism of a of a functioning healthy society now i think every, everyone there's so much hostility and elitism uh uh that's part of everyone just just kind of uh putting themselves in their little niches yeah exactly i mean the the the, the physicist and the biologist has the immediate assumption that they have the primacy when it comes to truth that, that, that physicalism and and biology basically the life si the so-called life science is basically just that's that's as high as you could go in trying to understand or explain the world there's no yeah. other what else could you appeal to there's only science and and direct empiricism um and again it's amazing how many of the people in those disciplines have never even thought of the question of whether something like naive empiricism is true or false or defensible right the, the, the very idea of we can only know what's what's uh, immediately presentable to our sen to our sense senses is so absurd and so so self uh, refuting that you would <laughs> you would think that people who someone would uh, notice the disconnect yeah but but that's the thing is that you know it's not ultimately just a question of of intellect or IQ or people having a lack of facts you know in my, in my theological perspective my philosophy man's the root of man's problem uh, is is ethical. It's his own uh, essential egoism and pride that keeps him from discovering the truth and making those kinds of connections. So it's actually man's will that limits himself by accepting things like atheism. And that's what's so ironic is that atheism is the most imprisoning, materialism is the most imprisoning box yes. to put yourself in in the midst of you thinking that you are gaining this this great liberal uh, 
liberation or this great freedom. Yes, yes. And uh, I, I mean, I mean, I wrote some stuff out here, but but that is what makes uh, uh, the kind of uh, pied pipering of, of people into atheism uh, so perverse, really. Is that they they're being sold one thing, and then of course they're getting the exact opposite. So I, I mean I mean th th this was like like well, like the things I've written out beforehand is is who who is well well let me let me just backtrack because like the guy I always talk with Max Colby uh, escaping atheism I we we agree on certain things and we disagree on on other things but what is apparent to both of us. Is that there has been a, a, a concerted effort to to foist uh, uh, atheism upon the public, especially yes. in the post uh, 9 11 world? Uh, we disagree on, on who exactly is doing it uh, and why and how, but uh, we, we we agree that there are some higher ups who, who are responsible for for this kind of propaganda. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I've it's it's uh, been a kind of working theory in my mind that. Modern atheism for a long time has especially come out of the Royal Society. I mean, this is where we can trace uh, the history of, well, I mean, this is kind of like the so-called global elite of academia out of Oxford, yeah. uh, Cambridge, uh, and certainly, you know, New York uh, universities and, and California universities, uh, you know, the East Coast, West Coast, and the, the UK Royal Society. But, but really, modern atheism has its birth, not even in the French Revolution, but in uh, Anglo philosophers and thinkers at the same time as the French Revolution. And, and some people theorize that it was actually uh, English and Scottish atheism that maybe propelled the atheism of the philosophes in the French Revolution, or maybe it was vice versa. But but I really think we have to, we always, we continually come back to, to English uh, Anglo pragmatism and atheism. And there is a, a Jewish element to that atheism as well. Um, and I think that there's also a, uh, an elite social strategy approach of promoting atheism. And that's why you see these guys, these, the big pop star atheists, they're promoted so heavily, uh, not just because they're some great debater or because they have some, you know, amazing high IQ or intellect. They're promoted because they're useful to where the social engineers want to take us. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, that was like the great irony uh, I, I noticed because when you think about academia uh, in the last, uh, uh, you know, 40, 50 years, you see it, think of it as being dominated by by uh, uh, continental philosophers who, who are post-modern, yep. post-structuralist and post-colonialist and just post everything. And now here, here you have a guy like Richard Dawkins who is <laughs> – this uh, uh, fusty throwback to the 19th century, uh, I, I think, I think uh, aren't his family like African colonizers or something? That is how non-post-colonial he is. So he is entirely a, a, a 19th century throwback. Yes. And it's very disconcerting. It's, it's like the people who I think would be uh, in the job of promoting him, I think they would have been, gone to the best universities. They would have been steeped in this kind of continental philosophy. So if they're going to promote a, a guy like Dawkins, I would think it would be entirely for cynical reasons. It's like, this is the, this is the, uh, uh, what, what, this is the gruel we're going to ladle out for the plebes. Yeah. Because it will get them to where we want them to be. Not because we, we actually believe that there's a whole lot of, to what Dawkins says, there's really not anything to what he says. Yeah. But he's, <laughs> useful, he's useful to our ends. Yeah. I mean, I have, uh, uh, several works here that that actually vindicate that uh, on, on in a very academic historical way. For example, um, I have uh, Albert Pike's. I have Albert Pike's entire Morals and Dogma. Uh, I've read a very large amount of the book, um, and what you have in Morals and Dogma, which is kind of the one of the Bibles of Freemasonry, is this atheistic approach to uh, using all different kinds of of philosophies and worldviews to manipulate different strata of society. So it's essentially a giant social engineering manual that uses religious symbology and has a layer of atheism. And, and, and of course, if you want to argue that above the atheist, there's a layer of Luciferians, that's fine with me. That's yeah. probably true. But, uh, you know, the funny thing about, about, uh, uh, about morals and dogma is that, uh, the, the whole, the whole treatise is basically supposedly about man's liberation from all dogma and religious indoctrination. And the book's called Morals and Dogma. Yes. 
yeah. that you have to believe. So there's a fundamental absurdity and contradiction in, in this. And then you say, well, now, why does that matter? Well, Freemasonry has been an institution that's been global for several centuries that has promoted atheism as a revolutionary philosophy. They promoted all kinds of leftist liberation, atheism, feminism, uh, uh, Marxism. They promoted all these movements globally because of their revolutionary power. And guess where modern masonry is based? The Lodge of England. It's directly out of out of the UK. I actually went to the UK about uh, three weeks ago. So I got to see all the Masonic stuff everywhere. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and what it functioned as, and this is very crucial to what you mentioned with Dawkins, there's there's a point to all this what freemasonry functioned as was a giant kind of spy network for the british empire i have a book that's actually been written by a famous academic that's on that very very point of of the masonic lodges throughout the british empire being basically an extended spy network for the queen yeah um so this isn't even a conspiracy theory it's just it's just mainline historians write books about it because people don't know about it now how does this relate to richard dawkins well the mythology of this whole period the last 300 years of england uh, of the royal society was that man is just a an animal right it's an atheistic naturalistic assumption and the first book right now you i'm sure you know this but we know that origin of species uh, its full title is of the favored races, which they don't ever talk about, right? So yeah. it's the origin of species of man and the favored races, right? Uh, but of course, Darwin's book doesn't actually propose that that man is that, that there was necessarily a transmutation of species. The first person to propose the transmutation of species was T. H. Huxley, Darwin's bulldog. Yes. And again, another one of these top Royal Society people. Now, what does T.H. Huxley use as his proof? Uh, he's got a bunch of drawings and woodcuts, wood drawings and woodcuts of uh, fantasy men that yes. he has made up. And these don't exist. These these transition men are not real. Yes. They're just drawings from who? A guy named Rodermacher. Well, who was Rodermacher? He was one of the top Freemasons in Europe. Uh, and he was the head of the Paleontology Society. You can look up, I think it's Jacob Rodermacher. So the point of all this was just to say that that evolution and the naturalism that we got from the 1700s on was not something that came in a vacuum. It's something that came as a result of a, 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 a mythical ethos that was at that time intimately connected to the British imperial philosophy. We are the end of history. We are the greatest apex of evolution. That is the British Empire. We are we are the highest of all. That's the point of Darwin's book. And, and are you also implying it was eugenicist, basically? Of course it was. Yeah. These, I mean, the Huxleys, the Galtons, they, they are the ones, I have all of their books right here. I have, I do a globalist book series. I have Charles Galton Darwin, another one of these Royal Society guys, in his whole book, uh, the next million years is that very thing is how yeah. do we kill everybody so again all these ideas are not disconnected they're absolutely connected and you're absolutely right to say that richard dawkins is just another outgrowth of all this same ideology he's a he's a, a useful device but i i just want to underline this point i i'm not telling you but for the audience i just want to underline this point that that atheistic materialism does not uh pick you up and plop you down right into uh, uh liberalism it, it, it actually can more naturally uh get you into a very kind of uh racialist tribalist sort of thinking which i think we're, we're see we might be seeing the fruits of now uh, you also brushed against something which I actually wrote down in kind of a, a topic for discussion is that is that they they I'm again I'm not just uh, conjecturing but there there seems to be an effort to use these uh, tailored little strategies to pick up these subgroups and and, and to put them it it's almost like it's almost like a, a, a you you have a Atheistic materialism, which is the ultimate kind of bland, homogenized worldview, which mm -hmm. seems like it's tailor-made for a kind of bland, homogenized globalism, basically. So how do you get all these little groups and get them to go into, into this big chum bucket of, of atheistic materialism? And I find they use these tailored little strategies to get them all, all on board. It seems very ironic to me 
that uh, uh, I'm sure you know, like black nationalism. And he said, oh, well, Christianity is the white man's religion, which was nonsense, of course. And they had black churches in, in, in you know, Ethiopia and, you know, in the Bible. But, uh, but yeah, so, so they, they seize upon victim narratives. They, they, they seize upon identity politics, ironically, to pick people up and plop them down into the homogenized uh, uh, world religion of, of atheistic materialism. Yeah, I think that uh, my perspective on that is that atheism is a phase that we've been put through. And then and then they I think the social engineers know that m man doesn't last very long with that. It might last yeah. for a generation. Individuals might have a period of that in their lives. Granted, of course, some people are going to be atheists all their life. Sure. Yeah. But uh, I think that they definitely want to take us eventually beyond that into other perspectives uh, that that are more amenable to where they want things to go. So the reason that that atheism is promoted is that it it's given the appearance of reason and logic and all these things, uh, you know, in academia and in pop culture. But what happens is that you find that ultimately these things aren't fulfilling. And what happens is a lot of times people will then return back to some kind of weird religious uh, movement uh, as they find atheism unsatisfying. Uh, and that's just because we all have that, that again, we're all, man is a fundamentally religious being, I think. And even as an atheist, he's going to worship something, which is why all these atheists either worship themselves or nature. Uh, they're, they're really no different than pantheists. Um, and I think that, that, yeah, in a global context, you can absolutely verify that, that uh, the social engineers want to take us in the direction of, you know, various forms of UN type spirituality, uh, a, a kind of a great example of this is in Huxley's book, uh, Brave New World, again, related to yeah, THR. The other Huxley, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, in Brave New World, which is their model for how things will be, they have a, a religion. They have a, a church service, but it's a weird civic religion where you go and you just kind of, you, I think he even calls it the supreme intellect or the supreme being, which is straight out of masonry. Yeah. You, you, you have this generic sort of, uh, recognition of the fact that there's a, a superior force, um, but the, the, the religion is, is completely created and controlled by the, in the book, the, the, the global social engineers who are, who are called the, you know, the world socialist controllers. Yeah. Um, so that's where I think that they want to take these things. And atheism is just a step on that road, uh, just like Marxism is a step on the road to the, to the, to the final state. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> this uh, dovetails exactly to what I was going to say, because I was reading an article, and this is just a little scenic aside, I was reading an article just yesterday, literally, about the uh, the TERFs, I, I, if, if I'm using the term correctly, the, the Turf? exclusive uh, radical feminists. That, that That's a new term of opprobrium. Oh, wow, okay. Used against uh, traditional second-wave feminists. Oh. Because... We all knew the contradictions that were inherent in the in the kind of gender ideology that I could, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I could identify as a woman and then play woman softball and then just you know smoke all their asses basically. So it it would it would seem to be in contradiction with with uh, feminism as it's traditionally understood. And lo and behold, those contradictions boil up to the surface in in, in a very volatile way. And so now, now uh, the traditional fe second wave feminists are feeling forced out of their own movement by basically trannies who are saying, "No, we're the real women." So I mean, the the contradictions that are latent can can have a way of bubbling up very quickly. So uh, we realize that that atheistic materialism has internal contradictions. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we can't expect that people are just going to sit around indefinitely, just just with these contradictions in their head. It might it might come bubbling up uh, uh, sooner than we expect. Absolutely, and it might be thrown into this kind of a kind of a, a pagan uh, uh, solipsism or something, whatever you would want to call that. Yeah, this is something we're going to cover, I think, in a few uh, podcasts in the future. Me and some friends where you're starting to see things kind of pop up online where people are, are being uh, corralled into these weird niches like paganism. So so now, oh, online, there's tens of thousands of views on videos about how you need to accept your Volk, 
your your ancient pagan ancestors well, and their that's true kind of religion the accessory that's kind of the little uh, handbag covered uh, carried by a uh, white nationalism basically yeah right and then but but you also got black guys that are getting into oh we was kangs and you know yeah. we're the the real black <laughs> israelites and uh then you've got um you know the other versions of this kind of stuff but but what i'm getting at is that yeah a lot of these things are are things that are put out there to to steer people in a, in a certain direction then they don't even realize how studied and how i don't want to say everything's controlled it's not but i'm saying things are put out there on purpose to to lead people in different directions um and you can find you know white papers and 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 big think tank research that studies this stuff and you better believe they study internet atheism and they study what happens to people who've you know been atheists all their life and where they go and you better believe they know how to use buddhism as a tool for example i did a bunch of uh looking into the the dalai lama just as one example um and a lot of people think oh well he's you know he's against china and he's tibetan buddhism that's a little more spiritual than atheistic communism and really, no. I mean, the, 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 the situation here is that both are bad news. And in fact, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that shows that uh, there's LA Times article about the, the history of the CIA using the Dalai Lama uh, in, in the Free Tibet movement. So whatever you think of the Dalai Lama, these things at a certain level can be engineered and used. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and, and all, the only reason I'm bringing all that up is just to point out that the same goes for ideologies ideologies are studied like what is uh you know the the what happens to atheists uh, in their psyche over 20 years uh, what what happens to uh you know churches and so social order when we promote atheism right, now the irony is that we've already seen this in countries like russia where you got atheism exported to them by bolsheviks and it led to the murder of 60 million yes. Yes. Orthodox christians over several decades so we know what atheism brings uh, but you know, this doesn't stop people from you know falling into this this nonsense uh, online. Well, yeah, and that that goes to the uh, that goes to the I think the philosophical and historical illiteracy of so many atheists. I mean, we're talking, right. we're talking before about you know utilitarianism and how utilitarianism was then buried by the 18th century. Right. And now you have just people who are so philosophically illiterate, they're going to exhume its corpse and, and dance it around again. Right. And the same thing is like we we know where these uh, purportedly uh, rational systems of you know, you know secular oh, quote unquote logical rational uh, socially engineered things and they end up with piles of hundreds of thousands of corpses. But these people are so historically illiterate that we're going to have to uh, retrace every single bloody cul-de-sac of the 20th century. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the mistakes is that a lot of times these movements are geared towards the young. They're geared towards the impressionable and the idealistic. And we're, we're all that way uh, in our 20s. I was that way when I was... You know, that, does, that goes to something. It's like when you have these kids who are teenagers, they're 20 years old, and they recite all these lines, the visible sky fairy, you yeah. know, blind the gun orders. They use all the, the Alinsky tactics. It's why did they absorb that so quickly? It's like if, if I were to quiz them about the French American War or something, they would not be able to recite all the things that quickly. So they there is obviously a delivered to them in such a way that they're just able to absorb it like in a few weeks, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. This is why Mao's cultural revolution was so successful was because Mao Zedong knew that he, if he and he had the, the uh, skull and bones and Yale backing him, by the way, which a lot of people don't know, but uh, in the OSS, Mao knew that if he if he could get the youth, he would have the energy uh, to basically wreck the traditional Chinese the culture. The dumbness, yes. <laughs> exactly. And it's because when you're 20, you're so idealistic and so easily manipulated, you haven't had enough life experience yet to understand how the world works. You buy into an ideology and you think that the system that you read about and that you concocted in your head that's been actually been given to you, it's not one that you, that you freely discovered, it was actually given to you. You think that that can just be mapped onto the world and mm -hmm. then the world will work right and everything yes. will be roses and we'll all hold hands and we'll be in a you know ugly jehovah's witness painting from a uh you know jehovah's witness magazine or something they all be you know fairies and whatnot but um but no the the reality is that that's not how the world works that's not how power structures work that's not how human nature works it's not how anything works yes. nothing works like the mindset of an idealistic 20 year old 
Well, that's the thing is like like all terrible things. Uh, I think new atheism is is a perversion of of things that have their basis in good things. And I think uh, it, it, it seizes upon uh, uh, these needs that we have that are particularly acute in young people, which mm -hmm. is like the need for validation, the yes. need for acceptance, you exactly. know, the, the self esteem. And and uh, new atheism provides all these things. Uh, the need for meaning, we have to put an asterisk after that because they don't have any ultimate meaning, but it gives them a mission. And, and they, they love a, like a sense of mission. Oh, well, now I have to convert the world, win the world for rationality. And, you know, uh, which is a great point right. that, that Nietzsche made fun of when he he mocked the pale atheist. And he said, you're just a flip side of the evangelist. Yeah. Yeah. Like, why? Why do you care? Why are you evangelizing? <laughs> He's like, he says, you're just as bad as the Platonists from ages ago who tried to bind everybody to the idea of objective truth. He yeah. Says, he, he's like, you're just an atheist Socrates. Get out of here. You're, you're, as, you're as obnoxious or worse than the theist or the Christian. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Nietzsche saw all the contradictions 150 years And ago. embraced them. He yeah. embraced them. Yes. And, and so, and so, uh, uh, I mean, Nietzsche was not giving us a, a metaphysical map of the world. He, he was giving us a position where we could take it or leave it, and it does not match up to what I want from the world or what I want for myself. Yes. No, it's just a you know, might makes right, and it's just this this sort of complete beyond good and evil superiority complex. But he's he's illustrative, just like David Hume is illustrative for yeah. pointing out how most of these people really don't take their logic and their positions to their to their full conclusions. If they did, they would be more consistent and they would be Humean or they would be Nietzschean. Yes, uh, and and obviously, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hume found that all skepticism brought to its ultimate conclusion kind of right. annihilates our, our ability to make scientific inferences. I mean, yeah. Exactly. So, exactly. so the whole scientific part of the scientific rationalism just kind of, evaporates too uh, uh uh under the pain under pain of their own skepticism yes yeah and to be fair uh you know hume thought definitely that you could do science he was definitely a, a big fan of science and mathematics and all that but he was just honest by saying look guys if we're, if yeah. We're gonna be, yeah if we're gonna be atheists we can't justify this stuff so yeah. let's give, let's give up on this whole justification process yeah let's just do it and we'll be pragmatic but but come on we're not going to be able to justify this or make sense of it yeah yeah so i i mean it, it's it's all very confusing for me and and what i see uh this is a point i've made many times in that we spent like the last 10 years trying to batter christianity into submission and of course christianity is the doctrine that preaches that there is neither jew nor gentile man nor woman slave nor free and so once we we spend 10 years trying to batter into submission what do we get we get we're right back into tribes we're right back into tribal so I, I think I think the on the left side with with you know Black Lives Matter Antifa and on the right side with white nationalists they're just two sides of the same coin because they both rejected the the unifying doctrine of of of, of Christianity which I think is what is what you were saying yeah and, and the majority of the alt right is uh, pretty much anti Christian they're moving yes. towards the direction of the Volk uh, neo pagan type stuff which is a completely controlled manipulated movement. I'd be ready to debate any of the bulkish people on that that want to want to debate that just like I debated the we was Kang's dude. Um, so yeah, the problem <clears throat> I would say there's uh, two essays to read on that from our perspective, <clears throat> the Orthodox perspective at Soul of the East, and uh, they're both by Ivan Ilyin, who is a uh, Russian Orthodox philosopher, and and what he writes about uh, on fascism and, and other critiques of fascism is not that it's wrong to be a supporter of your people or your kinfolk. In our view, that's the public statement and teaching of the Russian Orthodox Church and has been for the whole idea of orthodoxy. Um, but what Ilian says is that the problem with, with, with fascism and the idea of the pagan imperium uh, or the Volk is that it becomes a new idol where you basically are just worshiping a manifestation of, bi of biology. And this is why I always point to the excellent essay uh, by Kerry Bolton, a rightist critique of biological determinism. And no, I'm not uh, uh, defending everything that Kerry Bolton believes. I just think that essay is a great critique from a right perspective that, that biological determinism is a dead end. And it's already been tried in history. And it's really just the flip side of 
of the of the international communism. Now, granted, there are there are things in international communism and Bolshevism and Alinsky style stuff that is way worse. It's way more degenerate, way more. I mean, that's like they're going to be putting, you know, vomiting on a canvas and they're going to smear poop everywhere and call it art. And they're going to do blasphemous stuff and they're going to promote abortion. And, you know, that's like the Bolshevik stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now and to be fair uh, in the in the ethno sphere of things when it doesn't fall into well, that, that's all useful for the complete demoralization of the, of the populace it is but right. i'm and, saying and but i'm saying that some people some people, yeah. some people will say ah but you see fascism uh doesn't have the degeneracy fascism promotes private property and the family and all this stuff and my response is that Modern fascism is just as much a creation of corporations and bankers as was the, the Bolshevik communist socialist stuff. And yes, the manifestation of one might be more gross yeah. than, than the other, but both don't work because both are, uh, again, idolatry because, because man is not just a biological being. He's also has a soul and a spirit. And so what happens is that in those groups, what you'll have is they come to this radical position where they end up denying the humanity in the other uh, ethnos, <clears throat> which is again, against what scripture teaches us. Christ tells us to make disciples of all, of all the ethnos in Matthew 28, the great commission. Uh, it, it's not the case that only, you know, the Anglo uh, or the Teutonic German guy has the image of God. All human yeah. beings are made in the image of God. And so we have a duty to that. That's how Western civilization, Byzantium, that's how they actually built cultures and, so, and, and, and a big, beautiful cathedral, social order type situation. It's not going to be built on worship of the self and the Volk. It's not possible. And it's yeah. already been tried and it leads to disaster just as much as the other uh, situations lead to disaster. So it's amazing to me that the alt-right types are just as ignorant of history and just as ignorant of their own history and Christian history and the history of the church and Christendom as the commies and the atheists are. Yeah. Well, they, they really horseshoe back towards each other. Exactly. But, uh, uh, Steve Charlie makes a, a very good but simple point uh, that, that there are kind of two types of nationalism. There There's uh, the one nationalism where you know, being American is great, and they're, they're over there saying, you know, being French is great or being German. Hey, that's great for you. We're happy. You're happy for yourselves. Then there's the other sort of nationalism where America is great. We will, you know, conquer you all. No other form of nationalism is, is acceptable. So there is kind of an, an I'm okay, you're okay kind of nationalism that, that I think is kind of healthy, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, I don't really. I mean, my my position is to uh, really reject all modern forms. So I I tend to prefer pre modern forms of social order, smaller tribes, uh, not worship of the bulk, uh, 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 nationhood, um, and monarchy. Um, that's a whole other debate that we could talk about. And and the the idea of the orthodox imperium. And really, in the modern world, that was really last instantiated by Russia. Uh, and uh, the czar and other places like Serbia and Romania up until modern times when democratic republicanism and, and its extension through Freemasonic lodges throughout the whole world basically toppled all Christian uh, countries and monarchies and removed all confessional states except for a handful, uh, which is just nominal on the books. But um, that's the problem is that the modern world is essentially secular and atheistic um, and you know that that's really just fundamentally contrary to the entire approach that i have i mean uh now granted that's kind of i don't want to be a larper or be a, be this idealist either I understand that that's not the modern world uh, we're in the modern world we have to deal with that and i see the modern world basically like more like the first three or four hundred years of the church where it, the, the, it has to be re-christianized right it's going back towards this secular pagan uh occult uh, uh atheist approach to, to the social order, it's going to have to be, be re-Christianized. So unfortunately, what we're going to get is brutality. You want to throw out God, you want to throw out uh, the ideas of, of morals and human dignity, uh, you're going to get brutality. There's yeah. going to be, you're going to get a brutal state, a global brutal state, uh, and it's not going to be what you think it's going to be. And all these atheists and these, these, these clowns are going to find out what, what usually happens when those kinds of, of power structures come to be as they get rid of their minions. Their minions are not respected. Their minions are seen to be the, the willing dupes, 
that they are. Yes. So and, and why you're just lined up against the wall? Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, uh, definitely, uh, uh, you, you see these disturbing cards. You see them on the left, like like you might have, like they're the, even the left is using terms like white. Like just like within the last year, I started hear, pe hearing people talk about whiteness, which is like an essential white characteristic. I, I hear people use other terms. Uh, uh, I, I forgot something else, but yes, I, I mean you you hear this this kind of tribalism uh, uh, where it's almost like uh, there there can be no rational discourse between tribes because white people have white thoughts and black people have black thoughts. <laughs> and Jewish, of Jewish thoughts, and this seems to be the direction that both the extreme left and the extreme right are going, where, where you just have these tribes, which is not really uh, very appealing to me because I like ideas. I don't like the idea that that uh, uh, there are no ideas that can be communicated. There's just a you know biologically determined mindset, and that we just have to war. You know, might makes right. So I I, I think Christianity is the is the only cell for that. I think so too. Absolutely. I mean, in our view, uh, man is not just one dimensional. Man is not just a biological bubbling forth. He's not just um, a, a member of the collective. There are many facets and dimensions to what it is to be man. So actually, orthodoxy has a very unique anthropology. So in our view, there there is a a there is a tribal component. There is a component to man that is his ethnos. The you know the traditional consistent uh, term that's used both in the Old Testament and the New Testament for a, a people group. Um, race is, is a little bit fuzzy because it's kind of a, a modern uh, post-Darwinian um, classification, but I'm not completely opposed to, the, uh, to what most people mean. They just mean a classification of a bunch of tribes out of Caucasus or whatever, like white people. I don't think there's yeah. anything wrong with talking about that. Obviously, that does exist. And yes, you can when you say black people and then you get more specific and you talk about different areas of Africa. Sure. Uh, those are just broader categories of uh, of big groups of people. So in our view, those things aren't necessarily bad. For example, our, our iconography, we, we always retain people's ethnicity uh, like St. Moses, the black who's a famous Orthodox uh, saint. He's always pictured as a black dude. He's yes. never, he's never going to be pictured as a white dude. This is why, in our view, we don't believe in like the Catholic practice of making Jesus into Asian Jesus or making Jesus into black dude Jesus, because it's very important that Jesus be the Jesus who was born from the line of Abraham and the line of David and, and born of Mary, right? Who wasn't Asian. A Mary wasn't <laughs> from Hong Kong, right? So, so G it, Jesus has to retain his historical identity because that's and a very important part of maintaining his human nature is, the, is that we believe he really did come into time, space, and history yes. uh, in a human nature. And so so we can never alter people's ethnicity or come up with it. But, but we also, again, we don't take ethnicity, which is just one component of man, and put that up into like the strata of the most important and, and godlike idolatrous thing that we're going to worship. And as if that's going to create the utopia, the Reich that's going to save us. No, it's not. It's just an idol. And Ivan Ilyin in his essays, I think, shows that beautifully. So for us, that is a component of man. It's fine to yeah. talk about man having that component and having that heritage and that tradition. Uh, the Orthodox Church, by the very, uh, the very fact of its liturgies, which is in different regions, uh, uh, vernacular native languages, that shows that we believe in the preservation of people groups and their cultures. Otherwise, we would just say everybody has to have like one kind of uh, uh, liturgy and it has to be uh, all done in the exact same way. No, there's a bunch of different types of liturgies that are set up and different different cultures have had different traditions. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that as long as they're in union with the moral law of God. Yeah. So, so in our view... Uh, I mean, to me, this all makes perfect sense, and it actually it actually avoids the extremes of, on the one hand, like the left who says uh, you you can't have any heritage or tradition and and gender and all that has to go away. We got to destroy all that because the only way that we're going to have the globalist social justice utopia is when we destroy everybody's distinctions. That is so lunatic. That's 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 Babel. That's Tower of Babel, yes. like total Satanism, basically. And then on the other hand, you have like the extreme of the right that thinks that 
biological determinism and IQ is going to, uh, I have the highest IQ of all, white, <laughs> of all white people. And if I have the highest IQ of all white people, I can create a white utopia and we will all drive, we will all fly to the moon in a giant white chariot and we will <laughs> erect a, a white space station of only white children. I mean, that's, come on. But that's literally what some people think. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, certainly uh, the atheist, the liberal atheist materialist is going to have to wrestle with that. How I mean, I mean, if if that is if there is no basis for human value or human worth or human rights, how are we not to say that the person with the better IQ isn't deserving of more rights or isn't more valuable as a human being? Well, most would, atheists treat them as if they're more evolved, as if that yeah. means anything, by the way. Yeah. So I, I mean the 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 internal contradictions are, are right, and honestly, I, mean, I, I was just I was just watching this black guy who's an atheist and and uh, emperor atheist. And yeah, I, I, I saw yeah. that. Yeah, Completely. somebody was sending him like my stuff and and mentioning him, and and so I went and watched some of his videos, and he's like, he's like, man, you believe in anything that you can't see? You I mean your IQ is something wrong with you something wrong. and i'm thinking like dude i could list like 20 things that you believe in that you can't see like what's up? i mean i mean this is the level though of, of that and that's what's scary about atheism is that they're so deluded in this this sort of this egoism that they would be willing to kind of instantiate a a state where if you don't have a certain iq you should be put to death yes yes and uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying that that guy was the that. Ones most qualified in any case. I'm not saying Emperor Atheist was saying that everybody who doesn't have a 120 IQ is to be put up, but I'm saying that that's the logic of the of the mindset. And that's why in the atheist regimes, you have seen those kinds of very bizarre uh, rules and regu regulations and regimentation. That, and that fits perfectly into the, the very radical uh, Fabian eugenicist idea, which is where we're going. So the modern world is not going into a Nazi eugenicist plan. It's going into a, a Fabian eugenicist plan, which is more uh, more insidious. Uh, it's not an outright put you in camps and kill you type thing. It's more yeah. of a we'll drug your food and water and experiment on you uh, like a lab rat for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And by 2050, as Jacques Attali says in his globalist text, we'll put in the AI state, which will determine who lives and dies. Quite literally. So they think that they think that the AI God <laughs> will determine based on the moral calculus uh, who's, you know, should be live and die and all this. And this is all, I'm not making that up. That's all literally in his famous globalist textbook. And when was that written? 2006. Okay. Okay. He says, by 2050, we'll have the AI deciding who lives and dies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is and this is what the atheists course. want. This is what atheists want. You, you're going to get what you want, atheists. You're going you're to you're get what you want, but you're not, you're not going to like what you get. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's... that's it's gotten far afield from what, from like what I, I consider. Well, I didn't mean to like go crazy. I'm not saying it's like the end of the world, or I'm just saying that that I can I can tell you that the top globalists say in their I've got I've got, I'm surrounded right now by 30 of the top globalist books here, and they say we'll put the we'll put the AI in, and it'll use everybody's insurance and medical data to decide who lives and dies. It's a it's a euthanasia. Uh, uh, radical eugenic state. Absolutely. Oh, so much. Someone's too expensive to keep alive. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's what he says. Yeah. If, if somebody wants to look that up, by the way, they, they doubt me. They don't want to read the whole book. Uh, I did a whole talk on it, but uh, specifically where he talks about the insurance and the AI, it's in about the last maybe pages 220 to two. 75 so about 50 pages you want to read just read those last 50 pages if you want like a real meat analysis from uh, uh and and chapter four which he calls the planetary empire the planetary empire i mean uh, you can't get any clearer than that but yeah so i i mean that's the thing i think there are some things with world views that that are so fundamental they're they're not even uh, accessible to like rational debate it's like that to me uh, just seems uh, uh, aberrant on a very deep level, and so I can't imagine 
any any advantage to that kind of system that would be worth the cost. Now, obviously, uh, some people do. I mean, some people think that if you can have people believing that they are cogs in the machine, uh, they will all behave as good little cogs, and that will be the utopia. Uh, I, 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 that is just disgusting to me. So it, it's very hard yeah. to understand how anyone would think that is an appealing uh, uh, end game. Well, and a, another mistake that is made by those individuals is the same mistake, as I said earlier, about the the people who came to power with Mao uh, or with Pol Pot or any of those people. Pol Pot actually went and had uh, people killed that didn't uh, that, that that had the ability to read because yeah. he knew he knew that whoever in the regime was an academic or could read. That would be who Mike could overthrow him. So you better get rid of those guys, right? Yes. Uh, and 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 Mao, the same idea is pre is present there. You have the the power struggle amongst the atheists, you know, killing the other atheists, um, and this brutality is a result of the idea that there's no human dignity. So yes. the, the the minions don't understand that that the system is not to free you, and 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 Huxley laughs about the minions in the book. He says, "You dummies." Yeah. All of these revolutions, they were not for your freedom. They were to put you in the brave new world. Yeah, yeah. You, you thought you were getting freedom. You thought you were getting freedom from marriage, and you were getting freedom from patriarchy, and you were getting freedom from religion, and you were getting all these freedoms, and it was just to put you in a test tube. Yes, and they, and they do it by appealing to your vanity, by appealing yes. to your pride. And have you saying, "Oh, I'm so much smarter than those, uh, uh, you know, fa you know, guy fairy believers." It, it it's so transparent how they, how they prey upon that need for validation, that need for pride, to to get kind of hoover people up in, into this atheist ideology. Absolutely, I mean, and this is just a reflection of uh, the Garden of Eden. I mean, the irony here is that even though you know, all the atheists would, would mock and, and snicker at the idea of uh, the Garden of Eden and Satan appealing to man's pride. The irony is that they all seem to echo it so perfectly. It says, isn't it just ironic that, that you have the same echoing of these same problems from Eden and the fall on, uh, which seems to explain quite a bit and yet yeah, yeah. no uh it's all just fairy tales well that is literally the plot of a short story i wrote <laughs> right. I'll send it to you you just described a short story i wrote oh, okay okay well well that's what happens in the garden right i mean i yeah. mean lucifer says satan says you will be as god god wants to keep you from your freedom uh you should be your own god determining what's right and wrong true and false good and bad you should do it all you got to do is Go your own way you'll be happy and then what you get is misery yeah uh, and that's why again you know christ comes that's why you have the incarnation to call us back to him um anyway i mean that, that's it, it, <laughs> it, to me it's so, it's so transparent that that every atheist reincarnates and re re reenacts the fall of adam i mean we all do in a way and whenever we we fall when we sin but i'm saying atheism especially Yes, it is a great uh, reinstantiation of that problem. But I, I mean, I'm sure you've heard uh, uh, many people say, "Oh, well, well, uh, you know, uh, Satan came to liberate us. He's the light bearer. You know, he, exactly. he set us free." They don't miss the most important point of the story, which was that he was a liar. The the everything he promised ended up being bogus. Right, and this is why Jesus says in John, part of the story. Yeah, Jesus says in John, he was a liar and a thief from the beginning. Yes, um, and that's because he stole man's man's life and and communion with God. Uh, man went along with it, right? Because he believed the lie. So, so there's a there's a there's a responsibility on both of them, right? It's not one or the other's fault. There's a responsibility in the, on the part of Adam to it's not. The believe. world's first blame storm. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and I find it very ironic with, with modern-day Satanists. Of course, you, you see the little uh, mission statements of modern-day Satanic groups. and the, We believe in you know, individualism and rationalism. And it's like all the stuff that sounds good. <laughs> it's like Satan doesn't have a really good track record with delivering on his promises. You know, That's the whole point, is that he is the father of lies. So, of course, it's going to sound good. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um... 
we've got some super chats. Uh, is, are you cool with uh, doing some of that or? Okay, sure. I'll get some more water. Yeah. So um, Jay's analysis listeners and streamer or stream watchers, if you want to have your questions or your comments read, you can do the super chat and uh, we will, we will answer them. Uh, while he's getting water, I'll read uh, Troy Sampson. Thank you for the $2 there. We appreciate that. Uh, Eric Jules. Ten dollars. Thank you guys for doing this. I think theology will retake its place as the queen of sciences. The state of affairs we are in now just cannot last for that long. God bless. Yeah, I tend to agree. Uh, it's going to be a long time before before theology has a presence in the social sphere as the queen of sciences. I think that's a long way away. But eventually, yeah, this uh, present order is not going to last because it's so self destructive. And I think we will have the re Christianizing. Uh, of of countries and the the re evangelizing of countries as they they experience all of this um, this decay and, and corruption firsthand. I mean, Russia experienced atheism for how many decades? They went through so much misery. And they're just now rebuilding tens of thousands of churches in Russia. So uh, so we are already beginning to see recovery, some sanity from the the milieu of endless meaningless atheism and its destructive tendencies. And again, globalists love to promote atheism. It's, it's completely destructive. Christopher Shad says for $5, any idea where to start with teaching my children in a homeschool setting? Uh, I can't really speak to that unless it's, you know, depending on what age group. I don't, so I don't know how old the kids are. Um, I've actually put together some curricula for um, some parents. They have emailed me and met with me um, personally. We set up different curricula and uh, classical education uh, uh, works based on how old they were, right? So when I was dealing with one guy, I think it was uh, like a young teenage guy. Uh, so, you know, coming into adolescence. So he wanted to kind of have basics about the trivium and the quadrivium and getting a kind of a rough classical education, that kind of stuff. So, it, again, it just depends on on how old the kid is. Um I would get, where is it? There's a, you know, get that book that's in my recommended reading list about the trivium. That's a good place to start or about, excuse me, about the quadrivium. That's a good place to start. Um, but again, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't have any, <clears throat> any input on like, you know, preschool or any of that kind of stuff. So Arthur tinted gel for $5. As a former atheist and a current Christian, I can confirm my indifference and hatred to religion was based entirely on emotion. Thank you, Arthur. That's a, a glowing instance of of honesty there. Appreciate that. I remember back when I was indifferent. Uh, I wasn't really atheist, but I just didn't really care. I think about age 17, 16. Uh, and I remember people would tell me stuff that I that I said to them when they would invite me to church, I was just like, yeah, fuck off. Right. I was like really just like, you know, rude about it. Um, and I, I think it was probably just a manifestation of, of my own, uh, in, in internal conflict. So uh, I can recall, it's been a long time since I had like a, something approaching a total agnostic mindset, but I can recall it. And I do, I do, I could see how it would be just kind of a manifestation of, of uh, inner turmoil. So yeah, and that makes sense. What does Paul say, right? The battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, thrones and dominions in the heavenly places that have deceived people. So keep in mind as the Eastern fathers and elders say, pity the atheist, feel sorry for them. Um, not that you have to give them any ground or, or uh, let them poison other minds, let yeah. them poison other minds, but you have to be aware that ultimately they are imprisoned uh, to Satan, and it is ultimately an act of their will. So it's they do have that responsibility, but you know, pray for their conversion. So yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just going to jump in because what you said reminded me of of what I was going to say when these kind of malefic forces seize upon what are kind of healthy uh, uh, kind of uh, you know dispositions of people. Is that I think there is a, a, a healthy and natural kind of resistance to to kind of institutional modes of thought. Uh, I think it's it's kind of natural when when we see people believing a certain way to to um, just Im immediately be critical of it for that reason. But I think the new atheism movement has taken uh, this thing that, that it, again is particularly acute in adolescence, 
where they see these institutional modes of thought and they kind of chafe against it and uses that to pick them up and plop them into this bigger institutional, much more restrictive mode of thought of uh, atheistic materialism. Pipe Piper twenty two five dollars. Uh, Sam Harris insists that being morally good and not being evil is so obvious that it's self evident, but then suggests life is all illusory. <laughs> He's embarrassing. Yeah, I mean that's so fundamentally uh, fallacious and stupid. It doesn't. I mean, I think everybody who's honest with themselves can see that that's that's completely absurd. Yeah, I, I haven't kept up with uh, Sam Harris in a while, so I, I don't really know what his position is on uh, the ontological status of the external world. But if he thinks it's <laughs> illusory and at the same time, he thinks it's self-evident to be good. What does that even mean? What is it? What is it to be good? How is something self-evident? Right. Uh, I guarantee you he would melt under those kinds of questions. What do you think? <laughs> I, whatever uh, Sam Harris is doing, uh, uh, he's obviously making bank off it. One of the, one of the uh, apparently pieces yeah. of forbidden wisdom I had is that he bought a, a $12 million tear down in Pacific Palisades. So he bought a $12 million house to tear it down and build another more expensive house on the land. Wow. Okay. Uh, and, 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 uh, and if I recall, he is a uh, determinist, right? He doesn't believe in yes. free will. Yeah. Yes. And, and he's, he's trying to get that into a kind of quasi new age kind of thing and try, try to, uh, Try to capitalize on the whole mindfulness fad and try to incorporate that. So it's basically like new atheism 2.0, basically. Yeah, and that's what. Um, and you have to give us as the as really the sole survivor of the original horseman. I mean, yeah, he had to adapt and change to be relevant. That's a good point uh, to to remain relevant. And uh, you know, one of my favorite things is the is Dawkins talking about aliens. That that always cracks me up. But. <laughs> Somehow, somehow, aliens, one of the most ridiculous things out there, that's more believable uh, than than theism. Yeah. Um, well, do you see the thing with panspermia and, and the uh, octopus DNA coming on an asteroid or something? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I have a, a, in my book, Esoteric Hollywood, for those out there that are watching, if you want to get it, get signed copies at Jay's Analysis. Uh, at the tab, uh, I have a pretty lengthy critique of panspermia and all that stuff uh, and Darwinism in the H.G. Wells Spielberg section of the book, which deals with Hollywood's promotion of the Darwinian alien mythos. And that those two things go together, by the way. So it's very ironic that Dawkins tells us about aliens. Uh, Randy Churchill for $20 says the Western is is the Western church atheist in the sense that they have a platonic God who is a false conception of God. The atheist has the same false conception. Now, this is a complex question, but from my perspective as Orthodox, this is kind of the root uh, of my, my criticism of Western theism. And this is because it's the criticism of St. Gregory Palamas in his debate with Barlaam. So I would say if you go to my read, uh, recommended uh, readings section of my, my website, you'll find the book by Mansarides uh, about Gregory Palamas. And there you'll find his overall uh, theological critique of Western theology at his time and ultimately how it relates to things like the filioque. So I would say, yes, ultimately, um, you can read uh, Sherard's book, Greek East and Latin West. You can read the chapter specifically about uh, from philosophy to theology in the Latin West. That's where he deals with that very question specifically. And that's also in my recommended reading. So uh, thank you, Randy Churchill. And again, you can go watch my many videos where I have critiques of Thomism and Augustinianism. Uh, and ultimately, yes, absolute divine simplicity comes back to the platonic conception uh, of uh, identifying every attribute or predicate of God with the divine essence, right? So absolute divine simplicity ultimately leads to modalism. It leads to a, a notional nominal distinction between the persons, the hypostases, and this is problematic. This is why, Again, the great mega treatise on this is St. Gregory uh, Nyssa's book against uh, Eunomius, the, the Arian heretic Eunomius. Uh, and St. Gregory goes to great lengths. He spends about a thousand pages refuting the idea that all the names of God are substantial predicates of the divine essence and that there's no distinction between God, God's essence and his energies or actions. So that would be my response to you, Randy Churchill. Thomas in pain, 499 says churches... Thomas Paine, by the way, was a Freemason. He put the uh, 
the uh, square and compass on the cover of his books. Uh, churches galore in Russia and mosque abundance in England. Yeah, I think that's pretty telling. Mm. Of course, and there are, uh, there, you know, Islam is extending into areas of Russia as well. So, uh, you know, not everything's rosy in Russia. I don't want to paint a, a false picture, it, but it's just true that there are tens of thousands of Orthodox churches uh, going up. And I, I think that's a good thing. It's a good, a good sign, especially given where Russia has been after decades and decades of communism and atheism. There seems to be a direct correlation between how secular a country is and how admitting it is of, of the refugees. Not that I'm entirely unsympathetic with the refugee cause, but I mean... Right, right, right. In my perspective... The secular countries just roll over and play dead, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that's because they are part of that globalist scheme to erase any kind of Western identity, Christianity, any of that stuff. I mean, the globalists literally say it's time to wreck traditional European culture. Wesley Clark says this, Peter Sutherland says this, countless globalists say this, Jacques Attali says this. Attali is like the big proponent of open borders for France. He's the he's the globalist uh, advisor to Mitterrand and Macron. And he's the guy saying, open the borders, bring them all in, destroy what's here. Yeah. Uh, openly, they're very open about it. It's not a conspiracy theory. Um, so yeah, I mean, Islam is a tool of globalism to smash it up against the the western idea ideology of christianity uh and the idea is that this conflict between these two will dissipate then you'll have basically new world order well obviously if, if the refugees are given the power to vote they'll just get the liberal together and get it in. yeah because the, they know that the left is going to be who yeah. gives them the freebies it's a it's a no-brainer uh and we have uh you know countless books uh kelly greenhill's book weapons of mass migration uh, you know, all the stuff that I talk about in the Globus books, book series all covers that in depth. And yes, it's the NATO operations uh, and the U.S. foreign operations uh, in those countries that pushes the migrants into Europe. And that's done on purpose. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Anthony Cavallo, $20. How's it going, Jay? Hope you were having a good day. Thank you very much, Anthony. I'm having a great day. Having a, a good conversation with Rob here. Uh, a lot of a lot of in-depth theology and philosophy tonight. Um, William Kane, ten dollars. What are your thoughts on the aerial tool houses? Keep up the great work, uh, William. That's a, a, a very difficult question. Um, I do like what's in Father Rose's book. Uh, I still haven't gotten Holy Transfiguration Monastery's big fat book or uh, 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 the Jordanville Monastery uh, book on tool houses. So I can't give a definitive opinion yet. I've read uh, Greek critiques. I've read Russian pro articles. I've read Father Rose's book. Um, so I'm not yet definitively ready to say that I have a certain view. But I do think that it's a pretty strong case that there's some kind of um, ascent that goes on uh, after death. So the, the argument seems to be a little bit stronger on the side of at least some kind of uh, ascent of the soul back uh, after death. Uh, I wouldn't say that that... <clears throat> necessarily means that there's like literal things that you have to pay at each toll house. I mean, this is read overly literally sometimes. I think that's a little little much, but uh, the liturgical arguments are pretty strong. So again, when I do, and I've read Father Rose's book, but I'm not totally convinced by all of Father Rose's arguments. And there are some good or uh, Greek arguments against uh, the arguments that Father Rose makes. So I'm going to refrain from uh, making a definitive statement until I've read the giant book that's like 60 bucks that I just haven't had a chance to get yet. So I'm sorry, William, if you wanted something more substantial, but uh, uh, I'm, I, as you get older, you, you know, you realize I, I don't know everything. So I, I don't, I can't, uh, can't go beyond that at this point. Not like those 20 year olds. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, so um, we're still in ch super chat period here. If anybody wants to uh, send any more super chats, then as usual, I will split super chats with my guests. So you will uh, not be just donating to me. Uh, we will split these with our friend Rob here. Well, thank you very much. So anybody have any questions for Rob, uh, deflating atheism, or any last questions for me? Um, and while we're waiting for any more questions, did you have any more in your notes you want to get to as we're? Uh, I, I think we, we, we basically uh, hit all the points. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, everything else is just like a, a little a little detail. 
but yeah, uh, uh, something, something I, I I noted down when I was talking about the the kind of uh, homogenized global global ideology of secular materialism. Mm -hmm. uh, I I also noticed uh, there were there have been priming studies where they primed people with with this materialist determinist worldview, and and uh, what what happened was that the the subjects became these kind of uh, infantilized. Uh, suggestible little tantrum, tantrum throwing brats, basically. Really, basically what we see in Antifa. So wow. there, there is like there is an empirical research about what happens when people are primed. Now you don't have to put a whole lot of stock into into priming. Uh, you may disagree with that as as a methodology, but uh, there's no reason to believe that everyone accepting this doctrine of 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 materialism and determinism is, is going to have uh, advantageous social effects. In fact, if anything, the, the evidence is, is against that. Now, you're saying that there's been studies about priming. Yeah. And the and this was basically what happens to people when they're given, given like an atheistic worldview? Yeah, yeah, a materialist determinist worldview, yeah. Well, that's what, I didn't even know that existed. I was well, earlier when I was saying, I bet you they've studied this. Yeah. Like I, so no, I didn't. I didn't know about this. Uh, do, do you, I'm not challenging you. I'm just asking. Like, do you have a link? Where, where could yeah, I go I, to? I, I can find it. I mean, I'm not. I'm not like a big like J store guy or something like you. Okay. I, I could find it. Yeah. Cool. No, that's that's great. Yeah, that that's not surprising. I mean, that's unbelievable wow and if you um, hear a lot of the the atheist youtubers it's really they really think they're like spreading the good word it's like, right. it's like mm or, 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 or rationality rules that they're they're they have this great commission to spread the great word of a of sight and that we could all believe that we're little cogs in the machine which just seems completely dreadful to me <laughs> absolutely well this has been a great talk um rob deflating atheism uh, anything you want to promote go ahead promote it now no, thank you. Uh, just just check out my channel, please. And I, I thank you so much. I thought this was a, a terrific discussion. And I sure. thank you for giving me whatever 90 minutes of your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, it was a great talk. A lot of good content. Um, and remember, if you want to get my book, Esoteric Hollywood, you can get it at my site. Uh, signed copies available there. Please get it from me, not Amazon. Amazon undercuts authors. You can also check out my TV show, Hollywood Decoded at Gaia TV. Also check me out as a co-host of Worski Live. We'll have Jim Goad on tomorrow. Uh, Rabble rousing author Jim Goad. So that should be a lot of fun. Uh, and I don't know what's coming up Friday, but also should be streaming soon with uh, Rome is Burning Again. We're going to do an analysis of the neo-pagan movements and the Volk philosophy. Uh, and we're going to take down some other sort of fringe type uh, ideologies out there, cults. So we'll be talking about that. So look for that coming up soon. And uh, anyway. Uh, T-shirt, so I'll just plug that. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, it, was a, it was a great talk. I look forward to talking again. Great, thank you. God bless. Right. Have a good night.